Good evening, everyone. I see we've gone live. And uh, just uh, as a reminder that the meetings are live streamed and recorded and available on the internet by viewing the Town of Perry Sound's website at www.perrysound.ca. So um, we will begin by uh, additions uh, or prioritization of the agenda. And I, we, I can mention we have uh, a Michelle Ogilvy as a deputation, um, be the second deputation. Uh, I realize that you weren't aware of that, but the item is on the agenda tonight for discussion and she would like to make some comments with regard to uh, pet grooming. And if we can move up item five, nine, sorry, nine, five, two, which deals with that particular item. Um, any other prioritization? The agenda? Nope. Okay. May I have a mover and seconder for the agenda? Uh, Councilor McCann and Councilor Backman, that the council agenda for February 2nd, 2021 be approved as amended. Anyone opposed to that? Nope, it's carried then. Any disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? Nope, okay. Uh, we have, I need a mover and seconder for the minutes. Councillor McCann and Councillor Burden, that the minutes from the regular council meeting held January 19th, 2021 be approved as circulated. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, anyone opposed to the passing of the minutes? Nope, then that's carried. Uh, questions of staff? Councillor McCann. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this would be for Mr. Cairns and uh, more or less a comment. Uh, and I, we've already sort of had this discussion by email with regards to passing along a, a note of thank you to the uh, uh, staff uh, out on a very cold night last week to fix the water main on Cedar Street. And uh, I think we all know that the pipes underneath there are uh, are old uh, to begin with and when they were put in. And they're just, they're obviously showing their age because, and we had the same problem on Wabick Street. Once they're you, you, you go in and you try to put a fresh pipe in, there's nowhere to attach it that's solid that, that will hold for very long. Now I did suggest, um, and just for the public's benefit, um, are we able to take a look at uh, some um, infrastructure work uh, in that end of town? Uh, in all fairness, you suggested that is something that we need to take a look at at a larger scale rather than just one uh, uh, street, but I thought maybe you could comment on the fact that Cedar Street is very problematic right now. Uh, certainly, through your worship. Um, yeah, I, we had a look at the uh, the data we have on the pipes, and, and I think I did pass that along that, um, you know, we're looking at a 1950s mm -hmm. vintage, I believe it's cast iron pipe in that area. And, um, you know, it, it's not uncommon that cast iron pipe has issues uh, in winter weather. Uh, during freeze thaw cycles or, or deep freezes and as frost uh, gets further into the ground. My understanding is we were dealing with, the, or the water department was dealing with a, uh, a historic repair. Um, so unfortunately, we're not exactly certain. Uh, it wasn't recent. It was something from the past. So we're not sure how long it had been in place, but... Um, They're moving up the street, actually. <laughs> They're getting closer to us all the time. <laughs> So yeah and, yeah, and certainly I think it's part of our bigger asset management strategy when we start to look at those infrastructure projects because uh, we need to obviously approach the problematic areas, but kind of in a, a systematic way to make sure that we're tackling, um, you know, a, on a holistic approach, uh, water, sewer, roads, all those sorts of things. But it is certainly um, something we will take a look at. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Councillor Keith had a question, then Councillor Borneman. Uh, yes, my question's for Mr. Cairns. I'm wondering if we can uh, please give an update um, 
I realize the railing for the Cascade Street still is not ready for no doubt engineering and a variety of reasons, but uh, this certainly the bottom half of that sidewalk especially is uh, at times treacherous. So what is being done in the meantime to help the situation, please? Uh, although this, this winter has been um, relatively easy from a snowfall perspective, um, it's had some other challenges and freeze thaw is, is one of them. When we get these nice warm days in particular, and then uh, you know we're going into double digits overnight, uh, we tend to see some refreezing happening in those areas. So uh, staff are aware of that area and uh, in particular and some of the other problematic areas and we'll be taking a closer look at it. Uh, I think what happened uh, recently was the extreme cold. So the salt that was in place on the sidewalk uh, because it was down into pushing minus 20 or perhaps below uh, became ineffective. So staff went uh, back and applied some other materials to that, but we will certainly be keeping a close eye on those areas. Okay, Councilor Barnum. Um, yes, the, my, my question is for Mr. Harris. Uh, Mr. Harris, I'm reading in places in the local media where uh, Questions have arisen with respect to uh, uh, operational costs regarding the, the wellness pool complex. And I'm just wondering how th those questions or if those questions are being addressed. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, reviewing the, you know, you and I have spoken about this. I, I think reviewing the costs in a fa similar facility such as Gravenhurst might give us a pretty clear indication where that that stands. And I, I'm just wondering if that's been undertaken at this point. Mr. Harris. Uh, through the mayor to Councilor Barnuman. Yes, that, uh, I mean, we, we have had uh, various people, some members of council in the area and others have asked questions about uh, the pro formas that were done as part of the due diligence work. Um, those inquiries have been provided to the consultants, cs &P architects that we had uh, prepare the pro formas. They've, as you've mentioned, uh, they've been working with the YMCA, the YMCA, the closest facility and the one that uh, approximates the type of programming that we envisage in this uh, recreation center for West Perry Sound is very similar to Gravenhurst. And so, the YMCA has looked at it along with CSNP and comparing costs in relation to the Gravenhurst facility. Uh, as a YMCA is the operator of the Gravenhurst facility, they have access to information that that others don't. Um, so they've been tasked with um, looking at that in relation to the costs that they had provided to the Wellness Center and Pool Committee. I think it was October 22nd, 2020. And uh, so that's uh, well underway. Any further questions? No? Councillor Backman? Um, yes, my question is for Mr. Karens. I'm just uh, would like to know if there is any update on the uh, funding that the town applied for through the Transport Canada. Uh, through your worship, I have not heard anything back as of yet. Um, we did receive another uh, inquiry um, regarding it a couple of months ago, but we have not heard back yet. And that is certainly something I can follow up on and uh, see where that stands. Okay. Um, especially as that, that uh, particular area obviously has had a lot of interest and uh, a lot of traffic and a lot of unique things going on um, in that area on the uh, Isabella Street uh, double crossing of the tracks. So. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree with you there, Mr. Karen. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing more. And... Okay, anything further? No, okay. Uh, correspondence, Ms. Johnson. 
Yes, Your Worship, there are three items of correspondence on the agenda. The first is from over 304 community members whose names are included in a letter requesting that the town keep the ice in until after the lockdown, citing benefits of skating and hockey recreation, et cetera, particularly for youth. Although this letter was dated before the last council meeting, it was not received in our office until some days after the last council meeting as an incorrect email address was being used by the sender. So uh, of course this matter was dealt with at the last council meeting on January 19th by council agreeing to pull the ice during the lockdown, but to reset the ice if the lockdown is lifted when it is currently set to expire with no lockdown extensions. So council's decision was communicated to the sender of the letter. And this letter then is before council tonight simply as a matter of the public record. The second item are resolutions from the District Social Services Administration Board in response to the town's request that DSAB pay property taxes that would be applied to three organizations, Perry Sound Nonprofit Housing Corporation, Georgian Bay Native Nonprofit Housing Incorporated, and Perry Sound Affordable Housing Development Corporation, if these organizations had not been made exempt from paying property tax. DSAB has passed resolutions in each case to pay the municipal property taxes for these social housing units until their operating agreements expire only. The third item was added to the agenda and is from Chris McConnell, president of Otsu Local 317, representing the workers of the Ontario Fire College. The letter is a call for lobby efforts to reject the plan to close the Ontario Fire College. Uh, item 951 on the agenda is a resolution addressing this issue. And those are the items of correspondence. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, deputations tonight. And our first deputation is uh, from Georgian Bay Forever. And we have um, uh, David uh, Sweetnam, Nicole Diamond, and Brooke Harrison here. So welcome. Hello. And uh, as a reminder, deputations are 10 minutes. So go for it. <laughs> okay, I am just going to share my screen. Okay with my presentation. Okay, is everyone able to see um, a full PowerPoint presentation? Yep. Great, okay. Um, good evening, my name is Nicole Diamond. I am the project coordinator for the Diversion 2.0 project with Georgian Bay Forever. Georgian Bay Forever or GBF is a charity focused on scientific research and public education on Georgian Bay's aquatic ecosystem. Our mission is to protect, enhance, and restore the aquatic ecosystem of Georgian Bay by funding accredited research on water levels, water quality, and ecosystems, by educating the public and governments on issues, and by enhancing the public's appreciation for their environment. Today, I will speak to GBF's plastic pollution mitigation efforts and present an opportunity for Perry Sound to partner with GBF on our Diversion 2.0 project. But first I'm going to pass it over to Brooke, who's going to give an update on the Perry Sound Divert and Capture project. Go ahead, Brooke. Uh, thank you, Nicole. And thank you, Perry Sound, for partnering with Georgian Bay Forever back in 2018 on Divert and Capture, the fight to keep microfibers out of our water. We have some exciting preliminary results to share with you today, but in the coming months, we, all we will have a complete report and paper published and ready to share. As this council is aware, microfibers are some of the most common microplastics found in the Great Lakes. Microfibers are from synthetic texti textiles and enter the environment in many ways, but one way we know they enter is through our washing machines. In 2019, we installed 100 microfiber filters on laundry machines in Perry Sound, a community with just over 1,000 homes connected to the wastewater treatment plant. We expected to see an approximate 10% decrease in microfibers at the wastewater treatment plant and the early preliminary results indicate that this is exactly what we are seeing, which means the filters are working. The filters reduce the number of fibers in the final effluent by about 4.5 fibers per liter. On the left of this slide, I have a box plot showing the number of fibers per liter. The left side dis displays the fil after the filters were installed and on the right is before the filters in July and March. As you can see, we do see a decrease after the filters are installed. We have collected more data since this graph was developed and we will highlight this as we publish the results in the coming, week, in the coming months. 
Um, to put this in perspective, though, Perry Sound Wastewater Treatment Plant processes 3 million liters per day, which re means reducing fibers by even just one fiber per liter, you would stop 3 million fibers per day from entering the bay. There is a bill proposed in California to address microfiber emission, and they are looking at this study and acknowledging that these solutions do work to fight microfiber pollution. So thank you, Perry Sound, for being a leader and supporting GBF to find a solution. We're working with legislators and policymakers, and we'll be sure to present our findings from the study to you in a few months. Now back to Nicole to talk about future programs for you guys to participate in. Thank you, Brooke. Plastic pollution is a global issue that we see right here at home. It's estimated that 10 million kilograms of plastic pollution can enter the Great Lakes every year. Sadly, if you walk along the shores of Georgian Bay, you are bound to find pieces of plastic. And plastic enters Georgian Bay in many different ways, from our washing machines and people littering, to open storm drains and blowing garbage, as well as the breakdown of in-water products such as dock foam and ropes. Georgian Bay Forever's Diversion 2.0 project, which is being funded by ECCC, our donors and municipal partners, will remove and prevent plastic pollution in Georgian Bay by trialing three innovative debris capturing devices. We will be installing seven sea bins, eight gutter bins, and three trash traps across Georgian Bay. Today, I would like to present Perry Sound with the opportunity to partner with GBF in trialing one sea bin and one to two trash traps. To tell you a little bit more about the devices, the sea bin is an in-water device that collects floating debris and organic material two millimeters or larger in a removable bag as it pulls water through the device. This device is easily emptied by turning off the power, pulling the bag out, emptying it, and putting it back in. The, with a 50 meter radius in calm conditions, the sea bin can remove an estimated 1,270 kilograms of pollution a year. There are now over 860 sea bins throughout the world that have removed greater than a million kilograms of waste. Gutter bins are installed at drain openings where they catch trash and organic material and sediment using a specialized bag that can be customized, ba customized based on location needs. In high traffic areas, the gutter bin can capture over 100 kilograms of waste a year. They are easily removed and cleaned by staff. Trash traps are engineered to capture pollutants in organic material as small as five millimeters as it exits stormwater outflow pipes. They have built-in overflows that allow for heavy runoff to flow past the netting unimpeded. Trash traps, um, depending on how much trash is collected by the trash traps, they can be removed with a crane mounted truck or if light enough, a two person crew. Routine emptying of the trash trap does depend on location and population. Uh, it is suggested that the trash trap be emptied three to four times a year. However, it could be more or less. Not only are we removing and preventing plastic pollution in Georgian Bay with these technologies, but we're also collecting important data. By asking our partners to enter information into our U of T trash tracker app when emptying the devices and through our deep dive waste characterizations where we take a close look at what exactly the devices have gathered, we will gather data on the main types of pollution we find. This data can then be used for further public education, mitigation efforts and provide support for policy change. You can see in the picture on the left is some of our GBF staff doing a deep dive and counting and characterizing waste. On the right, you can see a picture of some of the pollution that was collected in a sea bin and the main one here being dock foam. Public education is a big part of the Diversion 2.0 project and it's a big part of everything we do at GBF. Pictured here is an example of what public education signage could look like near our installed diversion tactics. Another educational component with the Diversion 2 project is Plastic Free Georgian Bay. This program will work alongside volunteers and communities across Georgian Bay to start up conversation with local businesses and schools about serving and reducing their single use and lightly used plastic consumption. Other education educational opportunities that GBF focuses on in the community is public education about dock foam. Unencapsulated polystyrene was by far the greatest pollution type found during Georgian Bay's 2019 shoreline cleanups. You can see from the bar graph on the far left 
that greater than 5,000 pieces of dock foam were collected during those 2019 cleanups. We would like to continue to educate, research, and provide alternatives to dock foam and make the public aware of Norm Miller's Private Members Bill 228, Keeping Polystyrene Out of Ontario's Lakes and River Act. Lastly, we would like to continue to provide education to the community of Perry Sound on microfiber pollution solutions and results of the divert and capture study, as Brooke has mentioned. We hope that Perry Sound will join GBF's Diversion 2.0 project by investing in one or more diversion tactics. We ask for a $3,200 investment in the CBIN technology, along with a commitment to maintain, install, cover the hydro costs, and record data during emptying. GBF in turn will, recover, will re cover the remaining cost of the CBIN and provide, the sta provide staff with training on emptying protocols. If interested in partnering with GBF on one or two trash traps, GBF will cover the entire cost of each trash trap. Um, we will also provide training to staff on protocols. Similar to the CBIN, we ask for a commitment to installing, maintaining, and emptying the trash trap routinely. In addition to our diversion tactics, we hope that you will choose to support our all of our plastic litter mitigation efforts with an investment of $5,000. This will help GBF continue education on microfiber pollution and promote results of the study. It will help us to provide educational material and mitigation efforts on dock foam, provide education and data collection material for our diversion technologies, and to help us further the Plastic Free Georgian Bay campaign. This is a total investment of $8,200. Thank you very much for your time. And I would love to hear any questions you have. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to, at the end of the presentation and questions, I'd like council to consider having uh, this brought forward to the budget. So, uh, Councilor McCann. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, you read, <clears throat> read my mind because I was thinking the same thing. I think this is something we do need to support and I think it's a very low cost compared to the uh, future savings of uh, our greatest resource. Uh, I do have a, a couple of questions and uh, with regards then, uh, Brooke, the, uh, you mentioned is it, it's dock foam, is that what you call it? The encapsulated dock foam? Yes, I mentioned dock foam. Okay, so where is, does legislation stand these days? Is it still being used uh, for uh, uh, flotation devices for, flo uh, for, floating, for floating docks? <clears throat> yes, it is still currently, as far as I know, for sale for floating docks, yes. Do you know that if Mr. Miller's uh, bill has anything to do with eliminating uh, uh, such foam? Yeah, so one of the goals of it is to ban unencapsulated polystyrene for sale for um, docks or for any purpose. What would be a, um, uh, an ideal replacement then for, uh, for the dock foam? I maybe David can step in here for us or Brooke there there yeah. I can't think of the name of it um yeah so we part of part of this program is we've um we've interviewed a fair amount of uh, uh dock dealers in in the Perry San Muskoka area of what the alternatives are um some of them being steel some of them being the um the thick plastic tubes um there is different alternatives and they are highlighted on our website and we want to continue to educate people of, of why these alternatives are, um, sh should be considered and, and then additional to supporting the bill that, uh, that has been brought forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor Bachman. Um, yes. Uh, thank you everyone uh, from Georgia Bay Forever for attending tonight. I've, uh, been in communication with Amber over the past year since previous uh, delegations and uh, in looking into our um, official plan and the stewardship of um, that we endorse for ethic for our shorelines that will include um, the treatment of pollutants, uh, um, I would definitely support this. Um, and one of the things that um, I do question though, um, with my own experience of um, being on our shorelines, especially specifically on our rugged trail, we have beaches out there that are polluted with glass. I did not see a lot of glass in your photos. 
And knowing um, that only a month ago I was on the beach and I literally took video from one end of the other to the other uh, and, and combed the beach to, and you can literally see the um, all the pieces of glass and on the map many years I visited I often pick up glass but it seems like I could stand there forever and keep picking up this glass and I'm trying to figure out where does it come from is that just historically um, you know and, and finding out what other communities around Georgian Bay are doing to deal with uh, such pollutants. Brooke do you have anything to add with that in respect to glass? Um, is it, I, I guess just a question, is it, I've, I've been on the rugged trail there before, is it glass, do you think, like from beer bottles, or is it glass coming up from the, from the water? Well, and that's what I'm trying to determine. There's obviously the color of the glass. Your, your common colors are brown, beer bottle, green, maybe an old 7-Up bottle, I don't know, and, and clear. Um, so I'm wondering, is it just historically from past users that littered or does glass actually come up onto the beaches around Georgian Bay and forgive me, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we've, we, we definitely have seen it. I remember doing a shoreline cleanup uh, in Collingwood this past year and um, I, I was shocked with the amount of glass and I, I wouldn't have said that was from beer bottles or pop cans or pop bottles because it was quite large. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I don't necessarily have an, a direct answer of where that source might be coming from. Um, but it's definitely something that we hope, I guess, to consider when we do these deep dives through the sea bins and see what it is that we actually are um, collecting and, and with them being all around Georgian Bay, we'll kind of have a better idea of what we see on the sh rocky shorelines in Perry Sound versus the sandy shorelines in Tiny and Tay area versus what we see across in, in Tobermory. Um, it will be, that's part of our deep dive. So I guess we'll have future answers for you of, as to that. Thank you. Councillor Keith. Yes, uh, thank you. I have about three questions. I was looking at the, the sea bin and I'm wondering, uh, first of all, how, uh, how big a bag is this that uh, that sea bin holds? So therefore, how, what's the frequency of um, it being um, whatever emptied? And what's the lifespan of one of those uh, bags? Those are great questions. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact size of the bag, but I can definitely get that information for you. For the purposes of collecting data on this project, we do ask that the sea bin uh, be emptied daily. It's just kind of like emptying another garbage bin. Uh, so we do ask that in certain locations though, for other people that have sea bins, they may find that it doesn't need to be emptied every day. Um, but again, for the purpose of our, our project, we do hope to see it emptied every day to record data. And I do have the fact sheet for the um, length of time that those bags are good for. I just don't know off the top of my head. So I will get back to you on that as well. Yes, Councillor Keith. A little follow up. Um, when you empty the bags, just as like you had the microfibers uh, in respect to the uh, washing machines, where is that refuse dumped? That would be, I would say just into um, a trash receptacle. Uh, just for clarity, so we're collecting it in from one spot and we're dumping it into a trash receptacle. This isn't plastic that's recycled, so we're just putting it into another spot instead of uh, where it is with the water. Is that what I'm hearing or am I missing something, please? Well, so we are trying to get as much pollution out of the water as possible. I think it could be very time consuming and difficult with smaller pieces of plastic to decide what is recyclable or not, because a lot of it's going to be very fragmented. So at this point, I would say that one of our best options is just to get it out of the water and get it um, placed into a proper trash bin. Um, but it, that is something we could discuss further in terms of the project. 
Councilor Horn. Great, thank you for your presentation. As we enter the 10th month of the global pandemic, we're seeing a lot of pandemic debris entering the waterways in terms of surgical masks. I was just wondering if you have thoughts on that and any strategies. I, our diversion tactics will definitely be able to capture those and remove them uh, from the water and um, from the storm um, pipes. Uh, in terms of decreasing the amount um, that is polluted, I think it's just going to um, rely on more and more public education and uh, just trying to work with the community to realize that it's not, uh, it's not okay to throw your, your masks on the ground. It's, it's like littering anything else. It's not, a, it's not acceptable. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? No? Okay. Um, is council agreeable to, um, well, I could say, is anyone opposed to having uh, this brought item brought forward to the budget? I don't see anyone opposed. So uh, we'll bring this forward to our budget when we have budget deliberations so that it can be discussed. And I want to thank you uh, for being here tonight and making the presentation and giving us an update on, on uh, the, the previous project that's ongoing and the new initiatives that you're looking at as well. So thank you very much. Thank you yep. so much for your yep. time. Yep. So our next uh, deputation is from Michelle Ogilvie and welcome Michelle. Deputations, as I mentioned earlier, are held to 10 minutes. So you're Hi up. There, everyone. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so hello everyone. And thank you very much for including me on such short notice. <laughs> uh, my name is Michelle Ogilvie and I'm the owner and operator of Dogs and Dews here in Perry Sound. As I'm sure you are all fully aware, dog groomers were deemed non-essential and unable to work due to the provincial lockdown. I would like to plead my case as to why groomers should be able to work to, um, to, work to all of you in hopes that maybe you will understand and agree. Dog groomers are vital to a dog's health. This isn't just cosmetic. Many, many dogs require it for their health. The government seems to be putting us in the same category as hairstylists, to which I say this. Do you, br do you brush your dog's hair every single day like you do your own? Do you wash your dog's hair every day like you do your own? Do you trim your dog's nails? I can almost promise that the vast majority of dog owners would answer no to all of those questions. Dogs are unable to brush their coat, which can lead to matting. Matting leads to a lot of pain and potentially many other health concern, concerns, which include sores, rashes, lesions, fleas, and even parasites. If hair keeps growing around a dog's eyes, the hair can grow into the eyes, causing eye infections that could potentially lead to vision loss or even losing the eye entirely. It may seem extreme, but I can assure you it does happen. Dogs cannot bathe themselves. If a dog has a pre-existing skin issue that requires regular bathing, that skin issue can worsen and over time can cause permanent hair loss and even spread to vital organs. A dog cannot trim its nails. The nails will keep growing and growing and growing. And when that happens, two things can happen. One, the nail will grow into the pad of the foot, puncturing the foot, causing severe pain and a very costly vet bill. I have seen it, it is not pretty. Two, the nail will keep growing to a fine point, which can grab onto things and potentially have the nail break off or rip off entirely. Um, and a lot of dog owners, they're bringing their dogs to uh, the rugged trail, where as we all know, we've all walked on it. There is lots of tree branches, there's rocks and dogs are running freely and if their nails get caught on that, it, the nail, it's not even an exaggeration, can be ripped out just like that. 
Many people are also not physically able to do the basic care at home. Some are not comfortable with doing these things at home. Some can't afford the higher costs of bringing their dog to the vet to get a nail trim or a haircut done by a vet. A nail trim at a vet, cl at, at a vet clinic is uh, $30, whereas dog groomers charge $10. They charge a very high, high amount for something groomers charge significantly less for. In terms of how my business operates, as well as other groomers in our area, since the last lockdown, I have been operating completely curbside. I have high grade disinfectants and cleaners that I use on everything I use between each dog. I allow 30 to 45 minutes between each groom to ensure that my salon is properly cleaned and disinfected. All payments are contactless. All waivers are signed contactless. When I was around people, masks had to be worn and social distance was a must. I took every precaution to ensure the safety of my clients and myself and my family. I can speak for all groomers in this area. We have adhered every requirement possible and more. You see, this isn't just about money for me and other groomers. This is much more to us. We advocate for those that can't advocate for themselves. I am being the voice for those dogs and my clients that are desperate to be able to bring their dogs back to me. I didn't choose this career for the money. I chose it because I wanted to help dogs. Yes, I enjoy doing the fancy haircuts, but I can assure you a good majority of the dogs I groom are in need of desperate help. I can easily operate my business with no human contact. So why can a flower shop be open, but I can't? Other regions have allowed groomers to operate curbside pickup and drop off. And some of those regions are Mississauga, York, Whitby, Guelph, the city of Niagara Falls, Durham, Halton Hills, and Burlington. Bylaw has been told that tickets will not be given to groomers until there is a clear answer given from the provincial government. Mayor Tory has also, also had a team of lawyers working to get the provincial government to give a definitive answer. Some of these regions are COVID-19 hotspots and they have made this necessary move. So I ask this, can we follow suit and allow us groomers to operate safely? I can speak for all the groomers in this area that we will be following every protocol. I ask you please, please help us and the animals that can't help themselves and allow us to work curbside. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, don't go away yet. There may be some questions from some of the council members. So any questions of Michelle? Councillor Horn? Sure, I do. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Michelle. As a co-owner co -owner of three dogs, and by the way, those ribbons behind me are not mine. Um, so um, it seems like a no-brainer for curbside pickup for your businesses. And if you could just explain the process once again for contact um, less, um, it, it just seems that drop the dogs off, hand them to you when they're done, come back and get them. And I just I just see that as just a, a really easy way to, to take care of our animals. Yeah, so definitely I can, for instance, with my business in particular, um, my salon is actually attached to my home. So when the client would come, they would either text me or call me and say that they were here. They would come up the deck, that's where the entrance of my business is. Uh, they would close the gate securely, they would remove all collars, leashes, clothing uh, from the dog. Um, and then they would leave and go to the bottom of the stairs. And then I would come out. I would put my own slip lead on the dog and take the dog in, do the haircut. 15 minutes before I was completed the groom, I would contact the owner and let them know. They would either pay me via Interact or sorry, e-transfer or credit card payment over the phone. I was really trying to stay away from anyone physically using my debit machine. Um, so most people were pretty on top of that. Um, and then when it came to picking the dog up, it would be pretty well the reverse. So I would bring the dog out, 
remove the slip lead. And then the client would usually be standing at the top of the stairs, which is a good 15 feet or more away from me. And then I would go inside and then they put everything back on their dog and then they would be on their way. Uh, like I, the last lockdown, I, I fully renovated my salon and nobody's even seen it yet. So like I, I've been really staying on top of making sure that I'm following all the rules. And then to go back with um, the disinfecting and the cleaning, once that client was gone, I'd go back in my salon. And when I say I would disinfect and clean, it was over the top. I'd be cleaning door handles. I'd be washing the floors with all these disinfectants after each groom. So I was really, really making sure that everyone was safe. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, all right, thanks, Michelle. We'll be dealing with uh, this issue um, uh, in, in a little while, okay? Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Bye. Okay, uh, that ends the deputations portion of tonight. So next we go to reports and I'm just gonna work it the way I see it on the screen here. So uh, up first is Councillor Burden. You're muted. Councillor Burden, you're muted. Sorry, okay. um, I've had no meeting since the last council meeting, so I have nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and fellow council members, staff and public. Uh, a couple of meetings to report on. Wednesday morning, January 27th, with uh, Councillor Borneman, I attended two meetings uh, held by the Belvedere Heights Board of Management, both uh, electronically by Zoom. First one was at nine, which was to uh, nominate and vote in a new executive and committee heads. And the second uh, was at 9.30, our regular board meeting in which we handled financial reports, life lease, community support uh, services uh, reports, and uh, the Belvedere Heights Constitution and, and bylaws. A lot of, a lot of housekeeping uh, indeed there. Uh, then uh, Thursday evening, January 28th, I attended the West uh, Perry Sound District Museum monthly meeting again by Zoom. It was a full evening. We received the uh, business manager's report, treasurer's report, and thanks to a, a December fundraiser, this is the kind of thing we don't get to report on very often. We actually ended the month in the black uh, as far as cash flow was concerned. So the, uh, that, was a, that was a real uh, bonus for us in that month. The uh, fundraising committee is starting a business membership drive and these memberships will include perks and benefits and be renewable on an annual basis. And you'll be hearing more about that. Our Corporate Development Committee has identified a set of objectives and they include a, 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 a docent program. Uh, it's for an active volunteer program and a means to engage the visitor with the volunteer who uh, stands and uh, gives you a, a guided tour uh, at no extra cost to your admission or donation to uh, your entrance to the museum. Uh, the, uh, we're all, they're also working on an active online presence via YouTube, a heritage channel, and uh, starting to uh, work with an oral history. Our mission statement we approved and finalized, and it reads, our mission is to collect, preserve, and share the history of the West Perry Sound District. We approved our budget for 2021, reviewed policies. We approved our proposed COVID, uh, COVID uh, uh, procedures. A part-time bookkeeper has been contracted. Um, and uh, another objective we have is we're hoping sometime this year to reopen the E. Roy Smith Gallery uh, for folks to see what we've got in there, which will, of course will include the, uh, the model train. Uh, then this morning with Councillor Backman, I attended the uh, Perry Sound Public Library Board meeting, and this is our first meeting by Zoom. 
Um, and uh, again, uh, we uh, looked at our Perry Sound Public Library COVID-19 Safety Plan 2021. It's been uh, now reviewed and accepted and it's uh, posted. You can find it on our website. It's also available in the, uh, the library. And uh, the library is planning on uh, moving ahead with a new technology center, which will be named after CN Corporate Services. And that was in recognition of the uh, $10,000 uh, that was made corporately from CN uh, recently. The, uh, we're, we have, um, uh, we're looking at uh, proposing new uh, dates for our meetings. And uh, we also talked about the cost involved uh, in replacing three furnaces uh, for the public library. The huge cost is due to the fact that you need a crane to get them up on the roof and to take the old one down. Treasurer's report was received and uh, statistically st uh, we are doing very well online uh, with Facebook. Um, we continue to, to get a lot of interaction there and we have an email blast that goes out every month and we have over 700 recipients uh, who uh, look forward to that each and every month. And so uh, the library is doing very, very well, can be very busy and that's my report. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hart. Good evening. Thank you very much. Because of work commitments, I couldn't attend the uh, Chamber of Commerce annual general meeting, which was held during the day last week. A new slate of directors were elected, and that can be viewed on the uh, Chamber's website. On Monday, January 25th, I attended the Perry Sound Area Planning Board meeting. There was two zoning applications approved for Township of McDougall and one for the town of Perry Sound. The 2021-22 uh, budget was approved. And also there was a resolution for the town of Perry Sound to be removed from the planning board, but that was deferred by the members so that they could have that discussion back at their own councils. And that's my report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Borneman. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Councillor McCann has mentioned the uh, January 27th meeting at Belvedere Heights. Uh, I think one of us try to do this at every meeting. We, we want to express our appreciation to the staff and management up there for the great job they're doing in keeping our residents safe. Uh, uh, they really have been going above and beyond. And I think in part, uh, that results from the collaborative effort with the West Perry Sound Health, Health Center, uh, uh, bringing the management team from the Health Center on board to support our staff at Belvedere has made a huge difference, especially in a time of uh, a lot of unknowns and, and a significantly heavy work, heavier workload than is the norm. I've also attended a couple meetings uh, at the airport uh, this morning and last Tuesday. It's pretty much uh, business as usual. This is a rather slower time at the airport than uh, through better uh, flying months. Uh, we have been uh, working towards a budget uh, that will again this year see no increase in uh, municipal uh, contributions. Uh, I spent a part of the afternoon along with I think half of the town down at the, uh, the waterfront, uh, there were a large number of people participating in skating and shinning and ice fishing. Uh, 15 minutes ago, I got an email from former Staff Sergeant Ron Campbell, who observed a gentleman go through the ice near the town beach this afternoon. The, luckily, the individual uh, got out. I bring this up only to give warning that uh, it's lots of fun. Be careful. Uh -huh. uh, hypothermia sets in really quickly on cool days like we've been getting. So uh, be, you know, be careful where you're going and what you're doing out there. And that's my report for this evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Borneman, and thank you for for mentioning that because people do need to be safe and. 
uh, take care out there. Councillor Keith. Yes, and I think that that was really a good um, approach in the way it's a segue into what I'm reporting in respect to uh, Mr. Mayor, fellow councillors, staff, and the public. It is unfortunate, and I'm glad that the, the individual that went through uh, survived. The um, Community Policing Advisory Committee meeting I attended, it was the first Zoom meeting that uh, the advisory committee has had, and it was sponsored by the town. And it's hoped at the next uh, meeting, if we are still in the same COVID-19 situation, that another municipality will take that on. But it certainly was appreciated. Uh, congratulations to uh, Jerry, Jeremy McDonald, who is the new detachment commander. And Sergeant uh, Don Connor was in attendance and as well as some of the other member uh, municipalities. The good news is for the last quarter, these stats uh, certainly are down. So for crime, uh, certainly it was uh, quite a bit lower. A uh, lower also though, uh, and I'm sure that COVID-19 does play a role in it. Foot patrols were down some. The community officer continued to still be involved in active media and other virtual meetings and uh, situational table continued uh, bi-weekly. And citizens reporting, though I was surprised, was basically the same um, as last quarter for, for the quarter of 2020, between October and December. I would have thought that there would be more citizen reporting online given the situation, but sometimes I guess, uh, my logic isn't necessarily uh, what it is. Now the planning uh, board, uh, Perry Sound Area Planning Board information has already been presented by Councillor Horn, so there's nothing I can add there. But I can add a bit of a positive for the ending. And that would be, we know that today was um, the day that we're supposed to find out about the little groundhog and how many days left do we have a spring. And, and the bottom line is some parts of the country said we're gonna get more, some we're gonna get less. So what can we say there? But I, what I thought was rather interesting in its own way is tonight on uh, Bow Street about uh, quarter to six, a um, Porcupine was crossing the road and he was taking his sweet old time. And unfortunately it looked like it, he had got hit by whatever the bit of the rubber of the tire or whatever. And you know, it just shows you, we have very kind people because two people got out of their vehicle and it took some time, I can assure you, to try to get a porcupine. Uh, finally, it was decided a rubber mat after the last two didn't work and to get this porcupine on a rubber mat and get it uh, gradually across the road. So it just shows you that there are kind people. And I think uh, the porcupine also showed me like we can only hope it makes it, but it uh, also was another reminder to say, I realize that they don't hibernate and they are alive in the winter, but it just really made me think that Maybe spring will be soon because there's one porcupine that was really ready to go. So anyways, that was my kind of happy story in a way and thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Backman. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, everyone. Um, on January 20th, I attended the Chamber of Commerce AGM this morning, as per Councillor McCann's report, I also attended our first library's board meeting of the year by Zoom. And on February 4th, I will be attending the Park to Park AGM and board meeting at 7 p.m. I'd like to take a minute just to uh, comment with all the um, um, you know, a lot, lot of the people down at the salt docks. I just want to remind everybody about the littering um, that does go on there um, over the holidays on Christmas Eve day before we got the snowfall. I ventured down to the salt docks and spent an hour cleaning up the garbage that was there. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it just showed that, uh, you know, there is still a lot of people that are spending time there. And, um, you know, I just uh, want to reiterate uh, that please uh, do not litter and uh, use the garbage cans that are made available at the trailheads. Um, and I'd also like to congratulate uh, local athlete, uh, Megan Oldham, uh, for winning a bronze at the X Games in Slope Style in Aspen. Um, you know, we once again uh, get uh, more recognition for the Perry Sound area. And uh, this is, you know, um, great to see. Um, it's a good start uh, to the year as well. So that is my report for this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, council, staff, and, and public, January 20th at 9.30 in the morning, I attended the Chamber of Commerce Zoom meeting and did the swearing in of the new executive and board of uh, directors. I'd like to thank you, thank all of those that are giving their time to serve on the new board and to those that uh, were going off the board, thank you for, for their efforts as well. At 1 p.m. I attended the IESO uh, Independent Electricity Operators Conference, uh, which was a virtual Zoom conference. Uh, later in the afternoon, I closed out the conference with a presentation on what Perry Sound is doing with regard to energy conservation, reducing green, greenhouse gases. And I'd like to thank uh, Forrest uh, Pengra and the crew at Lakeland Power for putting the material together for uh, the presentation that I made. Um, I'm certainly very proud and, you know, the with everything that's going on that we are working towards an energy net zero community. So um, it's excellent for our community to be in this position. Uh, January 28th, I had the uh, AMO executive meeting and the AMO committee of the whole meetings. Uh, January 29th was the AMO board meeting, and it was certainly a busy and full meeting for the first meeting of the year. And as a reminder to any councillors um, that might be besides our own council, but might be listening to this, please keep your eye on the AMO watch list for the latest information from AMO uh, that they put out. And I would also like to congratulate Megan Oldham. I, I heard that on the weekend and I thought, wow, this is really good uh, for a Perry Sound lady to be, young lady to be, you know, a silver and a bronze. And uh, so just uh, Megan, keep it up. And I'm, everybody's uh, pretty proud of what you're doing. And that's my report. Um, we will begin with item 952, which the one moved forward. So it was moved from by Councillor Keith and seconded by Councillor Burden that whereas pet grooming is important to health and welfare of these animals, and whereas pet grooming businesses have adapted best practices during COVID pandemic, developing high standards of health and safety and making their businesses contactless. Now, therefore, the Council of the Corporation of Town of Perry Sound authorizes the mayor to send a letter to the Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health requesting that pet grooming be deemed as an essential service for the purposes of enabling pet grooming businesses to stay open during the current stay at home order. And this should also be copied to our health unit as well. I'm going to ask first, before I take any questions or uh, comments from staff, if um, Chief Thompson has anything that he has wants to say with regard to this. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, at this time, I think that the the resolution that's presented to Council is very clear in that it's uh, just making a recommendation to uh, senior level of government whose legislation this is um, with regards to something that they should consider. So I think that's quite appropriate and uh, is a course of action that's quite suitable for Council to take. Okay, thank you. Councillor McCann, do you have a question? Uh, yes, and more of, of a comment. Now, I certainly support this, but I just uh, this goes to show that one size does not fit all. And uh, when I was first read that this was coming to us, and I'm, you know, I think 
my first impression, along with most of the public, was, oh, great, you can get your dog's haircut, but you can't get your own haircut. But education seems to be the thing that we need to get out there and let people know that every situation has its own merit. Um, when Megan spoke uh, uh, this, after, uh, this evening, um, and when I read this North Star article, uh, I became aware of just how important it is for this to be done. So I think it, um, when a request like this comes forward, uh, if we have the education, we make a responsible decision and, uh, and we move forward. Uh, it's been hard and difficult because a lot of people don't uh, see the credibility in, in so much, so many of these blanket decisions to just shut everybody down. Why can I get flowers and go to Walmart, but I can't uh, you know, uh, get a haircut and that sort of thing. So I'm glad to see this come forward. It has been an opportunity for education and I certainly would support uh, moving forward and I hope that the province sees this as vital as well. Thank you. Are there any further questions, comments? No? Um, I, I would like a copy of this. It doesn't say this here, but go to our health unit as well, which I think is appropriate. So anyone opposed uh, to this resolution? No, it's carried then. Thank you. Okay, the next item is uh, 911 and it's moved by Councillor Keith and second by Councillor Horn. Whereas on January 12th, 2021, the province of Ontario once again issued a state of emergency order. And whereas the province has ordered non-essential businesses to close to the public during this time, and whereas fewer businesses were deemed non-essential under this newest order, allowing more businesses to carry on their business and keep their employees working. And whereas there should be an incentive for property owners to continue to pay their property taxes and not encumber their property into the future. And whereas property taxes are the town's primary source of revenue, and it is important to encourage payment to maintain sufficient municipal cash flows to fund operations and meet the town's payment obligations. And whereas the province of Ontario currently makes small business support grants available to businesses, and these programs include property taxation and energy rebates, and not all taxpayers are unable to pay their prop, whereas not all taxpayers are unable to pay their property taxes. Therefore, given the Provincial Financial Assistance Program for small businesses, staff be directed to work with those taxpayers having difficulty paying their taxes, including developing payment plans as an alternative, alternative to assist the broad, the board waiving of broad, I guess it should be, anyway, waiving of penalty or interest on tax and water sewer accounts in 2021. And I'm going to ask Ms. Phillips if she's got anything that she wants to add to this. Uh, but I would also like to um, introduce Suzanne Diller, who's our new manager of accounting. So welcome, Suzanne. There we are. Thank you. Hi, sorry, thank you very much. I'm glad to be back uh, working in the town of Prairie Sound. I know there's a little summary in the um, agenda package, so I'm glad to be back. Good, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Ms. Phillips, did you have anything you wanted to add to this resolution? Uh, not too much, it's pretty self-explanatory, just that uh, when we did waive penalty before, uh, some uh, corporations will take advantage of that and not uh, pay their taxes. So it's, that's another consideration in, as part of this, um, as well as the, the options that are available through, uh, through the provincial government right now to help small business owners. So. Okay. I'm just thinking that some of these might not be like businesses as well. They might be people that uh, like residents that may be facing some challenges as well. So 
Yes, so I would encourage um, those residents to, to contact uh, the property tax department so uh, that we may uh, provide some options. Uh, currently, we uh, assist those uh, residents by offering pre-authorized payment plans so, so that they can uh, try to keep up with their payments at, on a monthly basis as opposed to paying um, installment amounts. So that's one of the options that's available and we can uh, look into those on a case by case basis if, okay. if they contact us. Okay. Questions, comments, questions from anyone? No? Comments? Anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? No, no one's opposed, so it's carried. Next item is uh, 912. It's moved by Councillor Burden and seconded by Councillor Borneman. The Council hereby approves the revised 2021 budgeting schedule as set in and attached Schedule A, and that the special budget meeting scheduled for February 9th, 2021 is hereby cancelled, and that Resolution 2020-122 is hereby revoked. Discussion. Council Barnaman. Just for those folks who maybe don't have access to uh, live, well, to, to internet, uh, can Miss Phillips kind of make the public aware when we're planning to, uh, to commence this process? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, so we hope to have an overview for council at uh, the March 2nd meeting and, and then the information will become available at, on that e or for, it, for that agenda. Um, and then there are two special meetings scheduled in this uh, proposed uh, revised schedule, which are March 9th and March 23rd. Uh, and then hopefully we would have a bylaw uh, prepared for April 6th. So that's the plan. Um, just due to project load and uh, vacancy in the department, we're, we're delayed a bit in getting the budget going this year. So we wanna make sure we're taking sufficient time and in, in reviewing um, and presenting a quality product for council, so. Okay. Follow up. Those budget meetings on the 9th and the 23rd will be live streamed for those who at home who do pay, pay attention to us? They should be. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Any further questions, comments? No. Anyone opposed to the resolution? Nope. It's carried then. Uh, moved by Councillor Horn, second by Councillor Keith, uh, that Council authorize a pre-budget expenditure related to the procurement of professional services to assess water and wastewater servicing capacity and develop computer models for these systems. Discussion. Councillor Borneman. I think when Mr. Kearns is putting, you know, generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of uh, sole sourcing uh, oh, yeah. things, but I think uh, in view of the situation that what Mr. Kearns is putting forward makes uh, good sense. I would say that, uh, you know, if you connect this back to last week's uh, discussion about water rates, it does make... Uh, anyone who believes that we're maybe lowballing increases in consumption and connections and such all the more suspicious so i hope that we keep uh 
a review of those rates on our radar radar on a regular basis depending on what this tells us mm -hmm. um mr kearns the information that is gathered here because i know we're also looking at you know in the future or whatever of development charges um will this also assist in the um, sort of rationale for development charges and the rates that might have to be charged. Uh, yes, your worship. Actually, that this information will definitely feed into that process, the development charge um, process in developing those charges and understanding what our future needs and requirements are. Um, so it, it also will support the asset management planning mm -hmm. process going forward as well. And certainly, um, as Councillor Borneman mentioned, I think it's also going to feed into a better understanding of water systems are, and wastewater systems. These are supposed to be self-sustaining systems um, paid through um, user rates. So certainly this allows us to have ac more accurate information to work with in developing those as well. Okay, good. Councillor Keith and then Councillor McCann. Yes, one quick question, Mr. Cairns. What is the anticipated uh, time span here, uh, provided this is a, approved tonight? How long should it be before we should be able to get some meat back here to have a better appreciation of the situation? Thanks. Uh, through your worship. So um, I've been asking those questions and we are working on that time frame. Um, it is well understood that this is uh, of importance to us and critical in terms of time frame as well. Um, as was mentioned, there are um, you know an increasing number of development inquiries in town, and we want to make sure that we can best support those inquiries. Uh, so I can't answer that directly right now, but uh, I will certainly get that information very shortly. Councilor McCann. Oh, yeah. Okay, go, Councilor McCann. Yeah, just, uh, um, I'm just looking here in terms of a ballpark figure, how, how much are we talking about in funds here uh, with regards to uh, this computer equipment? And I imagine that includes software as well. Um, through your worship. So yes, I, I don't wanna give the impression that we're buying computer equipment to support this. This is, uh, this is an assessment of our systems. Yeah. So it will take computer data that we have on our systems, as well as our flow rates and those sorts of things between water and wastewater systems um, and feed into some computerized models to give us an idea of, it helps us pinpoint bottlenecks um, and you know, problem points, uh, perhaps areas that are sufficient for the next you know, projected development uh, okay. period. Um, but we're estimating somewhere between, I believe it was 110 and $125,000 is the estimated total between the two. Okay. And I misunderstood then. I was thinking we're looking for new <laughs> hardware. <laughs> so Councilor McCann, that. the, yeah, the, the one for the computer equipment was stuck to another, um, anyway, it was stuck to another, uh, um, resolution. So unfortunately, because I remembered there was one for computer equipment that needed to be done, but it, I just I just flipped this over and, and found the other resolution stuck to the back of another one. So as soon as we finish this one, we will go back and we will take him, ca care of the computer one. So that's my out then. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Keith. Yes, thank you. My follow-up, uh, Mr. Cairns, uh, I realize you might be able to button down right to the day, but are we talking later this year? You anticipate this information would be presented to council, or are we talking in uh, 2022? Just a rough idea, please. Certainly, through your worship. Uh, no, that would be this year, uh, is our anticipation for sure. Uh, we are going to have a push, and we will be supplying the information and supporting the process entirely from our end as well. Okay. Anything for, further with regard to 922A? No, anyone opposed to passing this resolution? It's carried then, no one's opposed. 
Actually, I am going to go to 922B because 922B is the one with regard to um, the people that will do the work. So it's fresh in everyone's mind. So it's moved by Councillor Burden and seconded by Councillor Keith. Whereas the town is receiving a number of development inquiries and it is therefore important to undertake water and wastewater capacity studies as soon as possible. Whereas the town's procurement policy provides for sole sourcing. Uh, whereas Tatham Engineering is a well-recognized engineering firm providing services in the municipal and private sectors. And whereas Tatham Engineering has significant experience with municipal infrastructure projects and has gained knowledge and understanding regarding the town's infrastructure through involvement in various projects over the years. And whereas Tatham Engineering has proven capable of delivering quality services and products in a timely manner, has become familiar with the town's current circumstances related to both water and wastewater challenges. Now, therefore, the Council of the Town of Perry Sound hereby authorizes the sole source purchase of services from Tathan Engineering related to the development of water and wastewater servicing capacities in accordance with the municipal purchasing policy. Any discussion? No? Anyone opposed to passing the resolution then? I don't see anyone opposed, so that's carried. Okay, now we'll go to 921, moved by Councillor Backman and seconded by Councillor McCann, that council authorize a pre-budget expenditure related to the procurement of computer hardware, equipment, and devices. Mr. Kearns, an explanation as to what we're purchasing here? Yes, certainly. Um... Your Worship, um, so the traditionally the town or, or historically we have an annual replacement budget for hardware um, to support the town's activities and what we're looking at is approximately 50% of the annual allocation in this amount that's uh, before Council for pre-budget approval uh, to support the replacement of hardware. Uh, which will support our remote connectivity as well as system security within our um, within our town systems as well. Okay, good. Any questions, comments? Nope, anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? Don't see anyone opposed, so it's carried. And next item is 931, moved by Councillor Borneman, seconded by Councillor Keith, that uh, the Council for the Town of Perry Sound authorized the purchase of two ambulances from Crestline in the amount of $152,957 plus HST, and that Council approved the purchase of one paramedic response unit from Roland Emergency Vehicles in the amount of $71,219 plus HST, and that said units be funded from the EMS Capital Reserve budget. Mr. Thompson, do you have anything you want to add to this at all? Should say Chief Thompson. Uh, through your, your worship, uh, no, I, I don't have anything. Happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Okay. Any questions? Oh, no, qu Council McCann. Uh, I, I guess, well, yeah, one, one uh, question, more of a sidebar, uh, Council, uh, sorry, Chief Thompson, these companies, uh, you've had lots of uh, success and satisfaction in dealing with uh, uh, Crestline and, uh, and Roland in the past, so I imagine you have no, no issues that way. What, um, are, are we disposing of used vehicles? Are they going, or will they be donated to another municipality? Is that happening as well? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. The, um, our general um, disposal processes is to see if any of the first response teams through the municipalities within the district could utilize the ambulances. If that is the case, then um, I bring that recommendation back to council for disposal purposes. Uh, if not, then the following year, these, uh, the other units being replaced would be traded in or else, uh, otherwise disposed of through a tendering process. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Thanks. Anything further? Anyone opposed to the passing of the resolution? Seeing no opposition, it's carried. Uh, got moved by Councillor Borneman, seconded by Councillor McCann, that the 2020 Economic Development Report attached to Schedule A be received for information purposes. And I believe Vlad is online. Yes, he is. And I believe he also has a presentation to make. Yes. Welcome, Vlad. Thank you. I'm just pulling the presentation up the screen. Uh, I think you can see it right now. Yes. Yes. The slide. Thank you very much. Uh, so good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors, staff, and public. The purpose, oops, yes. The purpose of my presentation today, uh, to this evening is to provide an overview of uh, economic development activities that were undertaken last year and also to inform the council of uh, key activities and projects planned for the current year. Well, uh, as we all know, when COVID-19 hit Canada in March of last year, uh, many plans and daily routines were put on hold or dramatically altered and that uh, uh, was also very true with, respects, with respect to all economic activities uh, and plans as well. So I had to very quickly refocus, reorganize and reprioritize my activities. And as a result, I developed COVID-19 economic recovery plan, which was submitted and approved by council in May. So since then, we have been implementing uh, various components of the set plan. And most importantly, we, on an ongoing basis, we keep local businesses advised and updated on uh, various uh, provincial, federal, regional uh, emergency support programs as they become available. And this is being done through a specially created business support section on the town's COVID-19 information page. And uh, uh, for some key and most relevant programs, we also promote them on the town's social media for wider coverage uh, within the area. Uh, last summer, beginning from July and through October, we supported uh, Auto 12 uh, or Explorer's Edge a voucher program called uh, Cottage Country Spirit. And under that program, uh, residents, re uh, Perry Sound and Muskoka residents received uh, packages with five uh, coupons, $10 each per package. Uh, and uh, those uh, coupons, of course, were redeemable with local businesses. And as far as town of Perry Sound, 20 companies signed up for that program. And we also promoted a provincial uh, marketing campaign titled Shop Local. And uh, I think many of you have seen bright orange uh, banners of that program exhibited at several uh, local retailers, mostly in downtown. In from July um, and through no, mid-November, when Perry Sound was put uh, in uh, green zone, I visited in person several businesses in town and area, basically to familiarize myself with their situation and uh, to sit down with the owners and, and try to find. Uh, um, support programs mostly applicable to their specific situations. And as a result, uh, five companies, three in town and two in the industrial park uh, applied and received grants up to $20,000 $20, per application. Uh, in late July and early August, uh, I started to notice uh, increased uh, inflow of inquiries from uh, uh, Southern Ontario, mostly GTA area, mostly small and medium-sized businesses and some 
uh, real estate agents. Uh, they were all asking about situation up here, up north uh, in our area, what was going on. Uh, but also uh, many were interested about uh, cost of uh, real estate, cost of doing business in general. So I decided to capitalize on this uh, new trend and uh, created a promo campaign, which I titled called Move Up. So basically, I, uh, I did a lot of cold calling and uh, sent out emails and uh, conducted Zoom and Skype tele, uh, video conferences with, the, uh, again, with businesses mostly in the GTA area. And uh, in essence, I edu quote unquote, educated those businesses about uh, uh, Northern Ontario in general and our region in particular and specifically about various funding programs, not emergency COVID uh, related, but general funding programs from the province via NOHFC and from the federal government via FEDNO available to local businesses and companies that come to, to set up shop in our area. So. Uh, the purpose of the program was to encourage businesses from Southern Ontario, from the GTA, to relocate up to our area or, or establish their affiliates here. And later in my presentation, I will provide a couple examples of, uh, well, success stories that were generated by this uh, campaign. In November, we here in town uh, created our own uh, local uh, vendor support program which we called Think Local and uh, under that program we distributed 510 uh, $5 coupons to local residents and uh, 41 local businesses signed up for the program. We think it was quite a successful campaign to help local retailers with their Christmas sales and uh, right now we're still collecting coupons from uh, vendors, but uh, we, we, we believe, and as of today, for example, the re coupon redemption rate is 32%, but we think it will grow up to 40, which is quite a good uh, uh, result for, for a campaign of this type. We also ask Particip uh, vendors that participated to provide feedback and uh, almost half of them responded in writing to us and uh, their feedback is all positive. Mm. Uh, they, they like the program, they see value for their business and all, more, many of them indicated that they would participate again if a similar program is, is offered uh, by the town and, 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 and we think that we will do it again uh, this year. Uh, on my next slide, I would like to spend some time uh, and discuss uh, cruise industry because it's a it's very it's a very important component, as you all know, of uh, uh, the tourism sector in our area. Unfortunately, the 2020 cruising season was completely lost, uh, cancelled due to. Uh, international travel ban that was imposed by the federal government, but we remain connected, we remained in contact with the uh, uh, cruise ship operators and we advised them that Paris Sound is uh, uh, ready and, and willing to accept uh, their ships and crews and passengers as soon as uh, the uh, restrictions are lifted. Later, last year in October, uh, we partnered with the Great Lakes Cruising Coalition, RTO12 and the local chamber and created a, a webinar to showcase Port Perry Sound to global cruise operators. That was, we were part of a larger uh, initiative by Great Lakes uh, Cruising Coalition. All in all, 11 Ontario ports participated. And in our case, we, we created a 12 minute video, which was viewed by more than 40 cruise operators uh, internationally. And two weeks ago, the executive director of the Great Lakes Cruising Coalition advised that uh, nine 
international, new international cruise ship operators expressed strong interest to enter Great Lakes and of course to come visit Port Perry Sound uh, in 2022-2023. Uh, as far as this year cruising season, we do have 13 visits by three operators confirmed, and the season is expected to run between late May, early October. But as you all know, there are existing restrictions on travel and new international travel restrictions that have been put in place this week and will be put in place next week or in the coming weeks. So realistically, we do not think that this will be a full season, but we do hope that uh, we will get at least some kind of an abbreviated season, probably running uh, from early August through October. Uh, next, I would like to spend a little bit of your time on film industry. It's not as important as, you know, not as big, sorry, as the cruise ship industry, but still quite an exciting, uh, exciting uh, component of our local economy. And again, last year, nothing much happened in this sector, mostly due to travel ban and uh, various uh, health and safety protocols. But we did support uh, the first Big Sound International Film Festival, which was originally planned to run in June but then postponed uh, to October, a three-day event. And we connected the festival organizers with uh, a leading Ukrainian uh, film studio, and they provided uh, their own short feature film called Anna, which actually opened the festival. And of course, uh, the Ukrainians were very uh, happy about it. Another uh, highlight of the festival was the world premiere of uh, Against the Wild franchise, their film number three, The Johnny Home. Uh, it was shot uh, in the Paris Sound area in, in, in the fall of 2019. The director and some of his film crew and actors were present at the screening and after the showing, uh, uh, they all participated in a very lively uh, Q&A session with, with, the, with the public and one actor actually connected via Zoom from his home in LA. So it was quite an exciting uh, event for all who were in attendance. So as far as this year, film industry, we do not see much happening again, at least during the first five to six months of the year of this year. Uh, due to COVID being uh, still present and uh, uh, various restrictions in place. But we do plan to support uh, the second installment of Big Sound International Film Festival in June. And then in October, as announced by Richard Boddington, in October he plans to shoot his next uh, feature film entirely in the town of Paris Sound. And uh, the project should take between three to four weeks, uh, depending on the weather. So I think it will be quite an exciting event for local residents. Well, now I would like to spend a little more of your time on uh, two successful investment attraction projects that uh, happened uh, in part at least uh, due to the move up program that I uh, mentioned earlier. So first and foremost, ECA Development Group, a team of investors from the GTA, they visited Paris Sound numerous times last year and as a result bought uh, several properties in town at the industrial park and one lot in Seguin. Uh, they invested in, in, in land uh, close to $4 million. Uh, so that's, that's real money to, to our economy. What they plan to do, they, they, they will build a, a highly automated, uh, modern cross-laminated timber or CLT prefab housing manufacturing plant at the industrial park. 
this actually, this will be the first such uh, enterprise in Northern Ontario and only the second CLT plant uh, in the whole province of Ontario. So I'm quite excited and this is a big project and uh, the total value is uh, about 30 million and up to 30, uh, 70, excuse me, 70 new jobs will be created when the plant become fully operational by the end of 2022. Uh, next slide, that's another project by the same company. So they plan to build uh, a couple CLT uh, buildings in town, in, in downtown actually. And uh, their first project will be a condo on Church Street, a five-story building, 20 apartments with the uh, uh, office uh, space on the ground floor and underground garage for 25 cars. Mm, as you can see on this sl slide, uh, quite a modern looking mm, construction and they plan to build several more mm, multi apartment houses in town and in uh, surrounding municipalities through the coming years. Uh, this is another project, uh, much smaller scale than eco development, but still, I think, of interest and importance rather to local economy. In September of last year, I, I connected with a logist, uh, with an owner of a logistic company from Mississauga, and he visited Perry Sound, so I took him to uh, Perry Sound Industrial Park, and he liked the location on highway but oh, he especially loved the price for land up there. So he bought, in October, he bought one lot at the industrial park uh, to build a truck and stop and uh, for his trucks and a small distribution warehouse there. So the project should generate about uh, up to five jobs and should be completed uh, by this fall. Well, as, as far as key initiatives for this year, for 2021. Obviously COVID will remain a, a major factor through the coming months, at least for uh, five or six months to go. So I will continue to support local businesses cope with uh, the pandemic. And in particular, we plan to run, as mentioned, we plan to run uh, think local, maybe with some adjustments and improvements, but we plan to run the same campaign uh, in spring, uh, probably in late May. Uh, I will also collaborate with the Paris Sound Chamber and uh, our new regional economic development officer to create new uh, initiatives, events, workshops to help local uh, small businesses. Uh, I will continue with the move up campaign and uh, I aim to attract two, three new companies from the GTA to relocate to our area uh, in 2021. I will also support R2012 with the new initiative to provide affordable housing for hospitality employees and uh, uh, in Paris Sound District, as we all know, this is a major problem for for the industry in high season, uh, there is a huge shortage of accommodations for temporary workers in, uh, at restaurants, uh, hotels, motels. So after 12 this, uh, applied for funding, for provincial funding, and they also hired a group of consultants to, to, to provide some solutions. Uh, I, I don't want to go into much detail about this initiative. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's fairly new, uh, but second and more importantly, uh, we just agreed with the executive director of RTO 12 that he will present to council in March. So I believe uh, he will spend a lot of time explaining this, uh, this particular initiative to you and you will have an opportunity to, to ask uh, him uh, questions uh, directly. Uh, of course, we will continue to work with the uh, cruise ship lines. And uh, as we see a lot of interest towards the Great Lakes, we plan to grow bookings by 40%. That is total 18 visits in uh, 2022. 
And together with Science North, Tokyo Center, Downtown Business Association, and, and other local stakeholders, uh, we plan to host the Great Northern Ontario Roadshow in town late September. It's a new initiative by the provincial government announced in December, and its aim is to promote local tourism in Northern Ontario. So under this uh, uh, initiative, uh, the roadshow will visit 50 municipalities across Northern Ontario, including uh, Perry Sound. So for uh, specifically for Perry Sound, it will be a two day event packed with the various activities to promote uh, hyper-local tourism and help uh, and, and profile, excuse me, profile local tourism operators. Uh, I think it's a great initiative and it's fully funded by, by federal uh, provincial governments through NOHFC. I think it's, uh, it will be a great support to, to our tourism operators who are really uh, struggling uh, during these uh, times. Finally, uh, I will actively collaborate with Canada College as they decided to significantly increase program offerings at their campus uh, in Paris Sound. And in particular, they plan to, uh, to prepare and run a number of uh, non-degree short-term trades training courses for local manufacturing and construction companies. And uh, I'm helping Canada College establish uh, necessary connections with, uh, with those companies in the area. And the first such program is, is expected to run uh, in early spring. Uh, also, Canada College uh, will bring international students first time ever to the Paris Sound campus. Uh, and they plan to, to, to have fifth, between 15 and 30 international students uh, as of September. So I'm working with Canada and uh, using my contacts with uh, um, academic establishments and, in, uh, and uh, student uh, exchange agencies in Central Eastern Europe to bring uh, some students from that part of the world to, to Paris Sound. Um, well, okay, so that concludes my presentation, but before I move to questions, I would like to introduce James Cox, our new Regional Economic Development Officer with the West Paris Sound Economic Development Collab Collaborative. James brings a lot of experience in economic development, which he gained uh, working at rural municipalities in Southwestern Ontario. And I, I think he will be a great addition to, to our communities here in the area. And I plan to work uh, proactively with James on several uh, projects already this year. A couple were mentioned in my presentation, specifically focusing on uh, tourism support and uh, business attraction. But uh, it is also my understanding that James is present at this meeting, so I think he would prefer to say some words about his past experiences and future plans himself. Uh, and after his brief presentation, I will be happy to answer any of your questions that you may have. So okay. James, I welcome you to, to, to the meeting. If we can unshare the screen, yes, then... Yes. Yes, I see. Yes, thank you. Ah, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, James. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Your Worship and, and members of council. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself this evening and also extend my uh, specific thanks to, uh, to Vlad and uh, CAO Harris and everyone else who has helped me get established as I have been, as I've relocated to the area and have been getting to know West Perry Sound as an area and uh, a lot of the organizations that work here and the businesses that make up this area. So I'm very excited to be here and uh, uh, to help the area move forward. I wanted to very briefly um, give council a, uh, a short update on what our initial directions are 
um, at the um, regional level through the West Perry Sound Collaborative, which, as you know, is a partnership of the seven municipalities in West Perry Sound. And the regional office has a specific mandate to um, build West Perry Sound as a region, as a cohesive and positive destination to do business. And I think that the work that we're planning on doing at the regional level um, ties in and complements um, what um, what you've just heard in the in uh, Vlad's presentation about the local work that's being done in uh, in, in Perry Sound. So my focus and my, my my past experience and my focus coming in here is uh, to focus on business retention and expansion. And uh, in the immediate term, this is going to involve a lot of outreach to the area businesses in the, the region as a whole to assist them with their recovery from the pandemic, but also in the longer term to build a better understanding, identify specific challenges that they may have uh, to doing business and uh, taking what steps we can to either remove those challenges ourselves or connect them with a support organization that can help them with that. Uh, and, and by doing this, we want to uh, be gathering the data that we need to um, uh, build long-term, build a long-term strategy to move the, move the area forward. I also uh, intend to have a focus on uh, development readiness. So tying in again with some of the investment attraction efforts that uh, you heard about in the presentation tonight and ensuring that we can take what steps we can as a region uh, proactively to ensure that we are ready and able to welcome investment and development when we receive those inquiries and when we receive that interest in, in moving to the area. We're still, um, I'm still very much in the process of um, gathering the information that we that, that's available to us to plan our specific actions and uh, long-term initiatives at the, at, the, at the regional level at this point. One of the priorities that I do have is to improve engagement between the Regional Economic Development Collaborative and all of the area municipalities. Um, tonight's presentation is uh, just a very brief uh, introduction, but uh, it is certainly my intent to uh, come back to uh, council on a semi-regular basis to uh, provide a more detailed discussion of our projects, priorities, and the initial results that we're achieving at the uh, regional level when, uh, when we, we do have that information to share. So I want to thank council for the opportunity to introduce myself uh, for their time today, and uh, along with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for being here tonight to introduce yourself and as this was live streamed and um, certainly recorded, so people can touch in, touch base later, or whatever, and and see the presentation and and uh, see who you are as well. Because getting out into the community with this whole COVID issue has been a little bit of a challenge. But uh, thank you, Vlad. I just want to say amazing amount of work that you've done. Thank you. Um, it, it's it's. You've, you've really gone out there, you know, gone into the businesses and talked to them and tried to help them out. And you know, certainly uh, from myself on behalf of council, thank you for, for, for doing what you've done. Um, I do have a question and that is the, um, the, the project on Church Street seems to have grown in scope. Um, are we going to have to revisit that particular uh, plan? Because I, I take it it's gone from 10 units to 20 units. Are we gonna to have to revisit that? Well, if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, first of all, thank you for your kind words and thank you, councillors. Uh, I do appreciate your support and uh, frankly, uh, as you know, before coming to Paris Sound, I also worked in uh, North Bay, and I must say that uh, the interaction, the support of you, the mayor, and councillors here in Paris Sound is much stronger than what I experienced up there in North Bay. But going uh, to your question, to your specific question, first of all, yes, you are correct the project on Church Street basically doubled in size. Uh, they bought uh, the adj adjacent lot there. And again, you are correct because <laughs> it increased 
from 10, actually from nine units to 20, okay. uh, you will have to, to revisit their proposal. But they, from what I know, they are currently working with Taylor. And as soon okay. as they are ready, they will have to, to resubmit. Yes. OK, very good. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Councillor Bachman and then Councillor Borneman. Um, thank you, uh, Vlad, for your presentation tonight. Uh, it seems very exciting. One of the items I wanted to talk about, and I don't know if it's something to talk about now or during our budget discussions, but um, do you see um, an opportunity for an economic development strategy in the near future? Well, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you for your question. Of course, uh, a formulated economic strategy is important. And at some point, I think the town must have and must develop such, such strategy. <laughs> right now, I think we're going through very unpredictable times. And frankly, honestly, I don't see a point of investing in a strategy and developing such a strategy which may actually change dramatically in two or three months or six months from now, as we have all witnessed what has happened in the past year due to COVID. So that would be my answer. So maybe we should come back to this question either in the next uh, half of this year or maybe even early next year. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point, Vlad, because we, we don't know where we're going to come out of this exactly, but also people right now are in a different mindset and they're not in the mindset that they were before where, you know, everything was as free as what we're able to do and work with. Um, and people need, we need to get past this a bit. That, that shows so that people can begin to try to live a normal life and get their, 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 their thought process around what the new normal might be and, and how we're going to work within it. So it's a good question um, and that, and, and your answer I think is, is, is a sound one right now because we need to know where we're gonna go with this. And there's no point spending a bunch of money onto it and, and then finding out six months from now or a year from now that it's not gonna work because we were in that previous mindset that everybody's kind of struggling right at the moment. So, but coming back to, to your presentation um, and what you've done, I think during these COVID times, you've done an amazing job to get what you've done so that we, we are growing uh, in, in the town and the area. Councillor Backman, did you have a, an, any other question or was that the main one? Uh, no, that is, that's uh, perfect. Thank you very much for your answer, Vlad. And thank you, Mayor McGarvey. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Keith. Yes, I just want to say, Vlad, it seems to me right now we're going through a war. And during that time, you've uh, managed to be able to present to council and to get involvement in the community and in businesses, uh, creative um, aspects and actually some meat again in a time where others may have just been uh, very negative but you evidently have a very positive outlook and hopeful and the energy that you've presented here and throughout the the, the past year I think is really um, accolades to you and I can only hope that this will continue I'm certain it will and uh, down the road I, I think we on, can only see good things from here so thank you other questions comments Councillor Barnuman well I'd echo what the mayor and Councillor Keith have said Vlad you're it's a uh, great work that you're doing for us 
I, and I think this kind of relates to what Councillor Bachman was saying in the sense that uh, being a bit of a dinosaur here, I remember the days when we used to have quarterly reviews and updates uh, departmentally and stuff. And, and I think that in this time, when things are changing quickly, uh, I'd like to see and hear from you more often. Uh, it doesn't have to be an annual update or even a six month update. I think that it serves you and the community well that uh, we're in, you know, forewarned is forearmed uh, is what they used to say. And I think it speaks to what the mayor says. We're going to have to be nimble and flexible moving forward. And you can only be that if you're aware. So, uh, as I say, I'd like to hear from you and, and others in uh, more regularly. I, maybe it's just me, but I, I kind of feel that there's a little bit of a disconnect through the COVID. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, the community be well served if we don't allow that to uh, continue. Thank you, Councilor Warren. And I, yeah, we, we, because of COVID, we've really, we just haven't been able to get together the same and it's made its challenges. And I, yeah, we have to work through this and we need to keep the information out there. And as I said back in January, people need to be paying attention as well. Um, you know, we try to get the information out through a variety of different sources um, and yeah, if you can be here more often and maybe James can uh, be here too. Uh, it gets that, at least we've, we've made that effort to get that information out to the public. Um, and we've tried. And if, if, if those people aren't listening, well then that's not our fault. We've done everything that we could to try and get the information out there. And this report, I mean, as I said earlier, given, given everything we've been through in the last year, um, you've done an amazing job. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, Councillor Backman? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my comment is for uh, Mr. Cox. I um, took the opportunity yesterday to watch your delegation to a local municipality, and I just wanted to comment that I was um, very um, happy to hear some of the feedback uh, presented there and ways to work throughout the community, but also with a focus on business and retention. Um, I see that as um, a lot of opportunity here in Perry Sound as one who sits on the industrial park boards. Um, you know, these mega projects that Vlad has worked so hard to bring to uh, the community, you know, they don't happen every day. And, um, you know, I think it's important um, that uh, we have someone, uh, you know, now two organizations uh, fully committed to that because I see a lot, a lot of opportunity um, for business expansions in, in Perry Sound, but also West Perry Sound. So I was very pleased with that. Okay, anything further? No, okay. Anyone opposed to the passing of this resolution? No, it is carried then. Thank you. Ah, and the next. It's a long-winded one. Moved by Councillor Horn and seconded by Councillor Keith. Whereas the Ontario Fire College has been in existence since 1949, and whereas the Ontario Fire College is one of the primary sources of certified training for Ontario firefighters, and whereas the Ontario Fire College has built a reputation of integrity, credibility, and reliability in providing some of the best training to our fire, fire services within the province of Ontario. And whereas the Ontario Fire College has been used to train and certify both volunteer, part-time and career firefighters throughout Ontario. And whereas the Ontario Fire College gives Ontario firefighters another option other than regional training centers to obtain National Fire Protection Association 
NFPA certifications. And whereas the Ontario Fire College is the most cost-effective method to certify firefighters to the NFPA standards in Ontario, and whereas the Ontario government enacted and revoked OREG 379-18 firefighter certification in 2018, and whereas the Ontario government revoked OREG uh, 37, again, 379 -18 firefighter certification, it was made known by the Office of the Solicitor General that the Act would be amended and brought back in the future. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Town of Perry Sound requests that the Province of Ontario reverse their decision to close the Ontario Fire College as the OFC is one of the best and most effective cost-effective methods for municipalities to train their firefighters, which assists us in protecting our residents. Be further resolved that this resolution is forwarded to the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Sylvia Jones, Ontario Solicitor General, Norm Miller, member of the Perry Sound Muskoka and uh, the Ontario Fire Marshal, John Pegg, District of Perry Sound Municipalities, Roma, Osam, and AMO. I'll open it up for discussion, but I do want um, a question uh, from uh, Chief Thompson. And Chief, my understanding is, is that they're they're looking at going to these portable units, but the one of the unique things about the the college in Gravenhurst is is that they actually have a a building that firefighters can train in that they use smoke and uh, other things or whatever so that they can actually experience going into a house that is filled with smoke and to try and navigate through that particular scenario. Whereas these sea crates that they might be shipping around are really just a sea crate with, with hot pots in them uh, that a firefighter can experience the heat uh, in uh, a, a, a firefighting situation. Do you have any comment on that and clarification on that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, the alternatives that are being proposed are, are a few. There's regional schools throughout the, the province that uh, would be available uh, in, in, as an alternative to the fire college. Uh, the major problem there is cost, especially for small departments. Uh, the cost is uh, significantly going to be significantly higher uh, elsewhere as compared to the what we have uh, been paying for small departments to go to the fire college. Uh, you're quite right in that the fire college does have a burn building um, that you can have live fire in. And our members here in town have partaken in that uh, numerous times. Regionally, uh, we have even rented the fire college on weekends amongst the local West Perry Sound fire departments and spent a great deal of time over there over the years to utilize the burn building so our firefighters can um, experience real fire with uh, live heat and also work together on a, on a significantly large scale so that we're on, um, on operational scenes, we, um, we're used to each other. There's more to the fire college than just the teaching as well. Um, an experience of going to the fire college, and many of us may uh, look back on our days of first going to post-secondary school. It's a very similar experience in the camaraderie and the experience of just going to the college and being immersed in fire department related uh, education uh, is, is an experience. Everyone there is of the same mind and uh, it is a experience that you don't get uh, by having people come into our station to do training on the weekends. You don't get to experience and meet people from across the province, maybe people from very small municipalities or people from extremely large municipalities where you can share experiences. So overall, this is a significant loss. Not all firefighters get to go to the college and experience it. Of course, it's limited in the number of people it can take. And also it's, it's quite a commitment on a firefighter's part to go, especially a volunteer firefighter's part, to go in their spare time. But the experience of going there really is, um, 
very important to the uh, growth of our firefighters as they develop. So there's a whole aspect of things that will be lost by not having that resource available to local fire, fire departments. And I would, I would hazard to say this is a method of downloading as well in terms of the costs that are going to be borne by municipalities that had previously been borne by the uh, provincial government. Okay, Councilor McCann. So, uh, <clears throat> two questions then for Chief Thompson. Uh, the uh, the Gravenhurst uh, School then is that a, like a residential uh, like a residential campus where people go and stay and, and train for a year or so? Is that how that works? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, people. It is residential, but it doesn't work quite like what you've described. Most of the courses are week long, and uh, it really was. Um, oriented for volunteer firefighters when it first started. Of course, the, the large fire departments have their own training systems, their own training grounds, uh, things of that nature. So the fire college is mostly utilized by smaller departments, but it is generally on a one week or two week basis. It's not for a full year. People don't go there for a full year, like a normal community college uh, experience. It's on shorter terms, could be weekends uh, or things of that nature but uh, it is specifically geared for municipal fire departments. It's not for people who are enrolling in a pre-fire service uh, diploma. You oh. need to be already uh, in a fire department to go there. To go there, sure. So um, is the, the unit in Sudbury still uh, available and ha has Perry Sound been able to make use of it? I understand that there is a... Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a, some sort of a fire college in a similar building that Mayor McGarvey uh, described uh, that uh, acts like a, I guess, like a, a stage or a template for a fire. Um, and I, I, think it's, I think it's actually in my hometown, actually, if I remember correctly. Uh, is it still there and is it still available? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, at the present time, I am unaware of something that's publicly av or available to the broader range of fire departments that's in Sudbury. There's a college in Sudbury, and I'm sure they run a pre-fire service program. Uh, there was a number of years ago, and it did not last long. I wasn't in, here at the town at that time. I would have been in Seguin. So that's over eight years ago. Um, a short duration attempt at producing a college, a for-profit college, very similar to the fire college, but it did not last very long before mm -hmm. it was deemed uh, not feasible uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, I'm sure the city of Sudbury has their own fire training grounds that they utilize for their own purposes as being one of the larger fire departments in the province. Sure, sure. Okay, great, thanks. Councilor Backman. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Thomas, many, Thompson, many years ago I worked for Pro State Fire Training Systems and I recall they used to uh, create these pans and um, outfit a, a lot of these uh, training systems. I'm just wondering, uh, do they still participate, um, you know, do any work with our firefighters throughout the community? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we don't interact with uh, ProSafe very much at all anymore. We did have a ProSafe system that we used for public education for fire extinguisher training. Um, and again, that was probably in the uh, 15, 18 years ago range. Um, most recently, we, we have moved away from that simply because, again, uh, it was for public education purposes. And the utilization of live fire has started to be frowned upon with the general public. Even for firefighters, to some extent, we frown on uh, live fire uh, training at times anymore. It's still an important part of what we do. Uh, ProSafe was live fire. We now have tools that are electronic that we can utilize for that purposes. And we have uh, our replacement for our ProSafe unit is, is stored here and shared amongst the uh, West Prairie Sound uh, municipality. Okay, thank you very much. Any... Are there questions, comments? No. Anyone opposed to the passing of the resolution? No, that's good. It's carried. Thank you very much. Let's hope this helps.
Moved by Councillor Horn, second by Councillor Keith, that bylaw number 2021-7101 being a bylaw to appoint Suzanne Diller as Deputy Treasurer for the Town of Perry Sound be considered as read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? That's carried. Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor Horn, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? No, anyone opposed to the passing of this bylaw? Nope, that's carried then. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Borneman, seconded by Councillor McCann, that bylaw number 2021-7102, being a bylaw to amend the fees and services, service charges, bylaw 2010-5408, to include an appeal fee, property standards and clean yards, administrative fee, planning fee, and cost recovery for damage to municipal property by motor vehicle accident fee be considered as read a first time. All in favor? And that's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings. That's carried. Moved by Councillor Borneman, seconded by Councillor McCann, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? Councillor McCann. Sorry, just uh, asking briefly if uh, Ms. Kruger could uh, tell us a bit about uh, what the amendment's all about here. Through your worship, um, certainly the amendments were to add some new fees to the fees bylaw where we previously did not um, have a fee for the public. This is of course to offset the charges so that the ratepayers are not uh, bearing the entire cost of these processes. So uh, the first one was an appeal fee cost. So if um, an individual were to be given a property standards order or a clean yards notice of violation, a muzzle or leash order, um, or were to be denied a business license, then there would be a cost associated with their appeal process. Um, that appeal process goes through council in two of those cases and in the other two goes through the property standards committee. Uh, there is also um, an administrative fee added so that if the town were to embark upon uh, work that was required to be done um, due to a property standards order or a clean yards notice of violation that wasn't complied with, that we would have a clear administrative fee that we add to any work that we've um, undertaken, which was a 25% administrative fee, again, to cover costs. Um, and then there was the damage to municipal property cost recovery. Um, that is a specific um, section in the fees bylaw that needs to be added if the municipality would like to be able to access records um, through the MTO when there is damage to municipal property by a motor vehicle. Um, if we have access to the information, uh, we can then pursue cost recovery in those scenarios. Okay, so that's, that, is, that is good news. I think that's a good idea. So there was no cost for it to appeal uh, initially then before this? Previously, we had not had any fee attached. Um, and of course, there is always the consideration that everybody does have um, the right to appeal in these cases and that they have access to that. So that was taken into consideration when um, assigning an appropriate fee so that people are still able to access um, that appeal if they want to, but that there is some cost recovery for the town. Great. Thank you. Councillor Keith. Yes, thank you, Ms. Kruger. I appreciate all your hard work here. I'm just wondering, uh, how was it determined what the fee would be? Was there some survey or how'd you come up with the numbers for the fee, please? So I did do research for other municipalities and it is varying out there as far as what fees are charged. There are fees that, um, there's not really fees that are much lower than what I've chosen, but there was quite a bit higher. And there's some places that still do not charge fees for all of the different appeals. Um, so we did try to select fees that were reasonable for the cost involved, but were not going to be a roadblock for somebody if they did want to pursue that process. 
Yes, follow up, Councilor Keith. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering roughly how many municipalities did you survey in, in this before you came up with your figure? Thanks. Uh, research was done for local municipalities as well as some larger ones. In total, I, I probably considered about 15 to 20 municipalities and what their fees were. Any, anything further? No, anyone opposed to the passing of this bylaw? Nope, it's carried then. Okay. By Councillor Burden, second by Councillor Borneman, that bylaw number 20, 21, 7103, being a bylaw to authorize the execution of Lakeland Holding Limited amended shareholders agreement, substantially in the form attached to Schedule A to be considered as read a first time. All in favor? And that's carried. Sure, my pen's given up here. I got to get another one. Uh, are all members in favor of having the second and third readings? And that's carried. Uh, moved by Councillor McCann and seconded by Councillor Burden that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time passed, signed and sealed. Any discussion or Mr. Harris, do you want to make a comment on what this is actually doing? Uh, certainly, Mr. Mayor. There's three uh, three sort of categories of amendments to the shareholders agreement. Um, the first uh, one goes back to October 2017. These amendments were voted on at the sh respective shareholders uh, meeting, but um, just for completeness and transparency with council, uh, both uh, Huntsville, Bracebridge, and Perry Center bringing these forward to the respective councils for adoption. So back in 2017, uh, the Cascade Street generating station uh, became part of Lakeland Power. Uh, the result of that was Perry Sound shareholdings in Lakeland Holdings increased. So that's one of the amendments to just entrench that in the shareholders agreement. The other one in uh, June of 2018, there were some amendments put forward to allow Lakeland Holdings and their subsidiary companies to get into other, other forms of business, expand their business opportunities to diversify from uh, simply being in the electrical distribution business. So that's incorporated into the, the amendments that you have before you. And then in 2019, um, the town of Bracebridge, Huntsville and Perry Sound, we thought it would be useful to have the shareholders agreement looked at, reviewed from the shareholders perspective. Everything to date had been prepared from the uh, board's perspective. And so a lawyer was engaged and there's some amendments that have been incorporated into the shareholders agreement as a result of uh, that uh, engaging a, a lawyer to look at the shareholders perspective. Okay. And, and I believe, uh, well, Bracebridge has approved it. Uh, Huntsville, I understand it was on their agenda and I understand they approved it. And so uh, it's now before town council. Okay. Means a bigger dividend. One. <laughs> Comments, questions? No? Councilor Borneman, you look like you're thinking about something. No, I, I sorry. I, I just every time I uh, we have stuff from Lakeland come come to the table, it's uh, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, 
we, uh, you know, a, a few years ago, we made a decision how to proceed and, and it's been, uh, it's been profitable for the town. It's been, uh, you know, we've got a new generating station that our grid is, uh, maintained, uh, to the highest standard, the work that's going on with uh, Mr. Pengra and the four, the uh, Lakeland people with respect to speedier and whatnot, it's stuff that we could not have done on our own. Um, not to mention the nearly $4 million that went into the town's coffers at the time. So um, I'm still pleased with that decision. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could add another comment. Yep. Uh, unrelated to the shareholder agreement before you, but just to uh, carry on from Councillor Borneman's comments, in the annual report that we uh, provided in December to the public, it refers to a decrease in the hydro rates for the Perry Sound customers that became part of Lakelands. As a result of the merger, um, Perry Sound customer rates were reduced. They didn't reduce right away at the time of the merger, but the OA, OEB requires you to, over a period of time, generally five years, to merge the rates. And so that merging of rates resulted in lower rates for previously Perry Sound customers, and that took effect in the spring of 2019. So as uh, Councillor Borneman says, the gift that keeps on giving, that was a, a, a result, a benefit that happened uh, uh, resulting from the merger in 2014, but the benefit didn't happen until 2019. Good so, point, but it got there. Yeah. Okay, anything further? Anyone opposed then to the passing of this bylaw? No, that's carried then. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Bachman, second by Councillor McCann, that bylaw number 2021-7104 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council be considered as read a first time. All in favor? Yeah, it's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings. That's carried. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Bachman, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Anyone opposed to the passing of this bylaw? Nope. Okay. Okay. Prior to adjourning. I'd like to offer the following information to the public regarding the next council meeting. The next regular meeting of council for the town of Perry Sound is scheduled for Tuesday, February the 16th, 2021 at 7 p.m. This meeting was held via Zoom video conferencing and will be live streamed and recorded. All regular council meetings are held at 7 p.m. on the first and third Tuesday of each month, except January and August, where only one regular meeting is scheduled. The council meeting schedule notices of special council meetings, complete agendas and minutes and instructions on accessing live streamed and recorded council meetings are all posted on the town's website. Go to www.perrysound.ca under news and public notices. Your TV airs council meetings on Saturday at 9.30 a.m. following a regular council meeting. For Kojiko listings, contact www.yourtv.tv Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Good night, everyone.